Welcome to Thought for the Day, which comes from the Avon Valley churches. They are set beside the Hampshire River Avon and at the edge of the New Forest. It is a very beautiful area within God's amazing creation. My name is Jeremy and today I'd like to scatter a few thoughts about creation. For his funeral service, Prince Philip chose a Bible reading from the book called Ecclesiasticus. It comes from the Apocrypha, which in this case is a section of the Bible included by the Roman Catholic, Russian and Greek churches, but not included by the Anglican Church. Prince Philip would have known from, this, from his early upbringing about this book of the Bible. It's also sometimes called Sirach. Jan will now read you a few verses from it about creation. I will now call to mind the works of the Lord. He has set in order the splendours of his wisdom. He is from eternity one and the same, so that the universe may stand firm in his glory. The sun looks down on everything with its light. The moon marks the changing seasons. The glory of the stars is the beauty of heaven, a glittering array in the heights of the Lord. Look at the rainbow and praise him who made it. It's exceedingly beautiful in its brightness. It encircles the sky with its glorious arc. The hands of the Most High have stretched it out. By his command, he sends the driving snow and speeds the lightning. The storehouses are opened and the clouds fly out like birds. In his majesty, he gives the clouds their strength and the hailstones are broken in pieces. The voice of his thunder rebukes the earth. He scatters the snow like birds flying down. The eye is dazzled by its whiteness. He pours frost over the earth like salt and icicles form like pointed thorns. The cold north wind blows and ice freezes on the water and the water puts it on like a breastplate. Thank you, Jan. That's part of a glorious tribute to creation. So now... Let us turn to the beginning of creation, which is described in the Old Testament and the Bible. This ancient Hebrew narrative is found at the start of the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. The world was void and empty, and darkness was upon the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the water. Wonderful, dramatic words, amazingly accurately describing early stages in the formation of our planet Earth. This account was told to the patriarch Abraham in about 2000 BC. Scientists nowadays talk about the Big Bang Theory. And I personally am content to believe them and to think, so that was how God did it. I don't find a conflict between science and the Bible. Similarly, the Bible's creation story continues with an amazingly perceptive account of the early development of the world. Apart from the time frame, we are not so far adrift between the biblical and the scientific account, even though there is over 4,000 years between their writings. I and many others feel that the use of words thousands of years ago may mean something rather different to their meaning today. Even in travelling to Ireland or to Cornwall, I have found that their ideas on distances and time are rather different. Beware of, oh, it's only just up the road, or I'll do it directly. <coughs> Your expectations may not marry up with your experiences. So when the Bible tells us that each step happened in a day, I think that it refers to a period of time that's now better described as an eon, which is an immense period of time. Both Charles Darwin and Richard Dawkins tell us 
that animal species evolved over eons of time. Paleontology and geology was also indicate that this was so. Therefore, I conclude, so that was how God did it. When we note how COVID is evolving month on month, we can understand that over vast periods of time, everything probably evolves. I think that in our schools, children are taught the science-based story of creation, which will please the boys because it includes dinosaurs. I suggest that we all need to support the teachers and then explain how the two versions, the science-based and the biblical, are two different sides of the same coin. Unfortunately, one of the leading evolutionary scientists seems to me to be a warmonger. He wrote a book called The God Delusion. Confirmed atheists and soul deniers acclaimed it and even said that Christians should read it. So I did. It was not at all convincing, if you know about Christianity. In his professional field, Professor Dawkins presumably bases his observations on proven facts. But in this book, I got the impression that his Bible research was based on old back copies of Jehovah's Witnesses publications. He seemed arrogant in making sweeping judgments, apparently based on a narrow field of reading and Christian views. I think that he makes many false assumptions, which he parades as facts about Christianity. However, he does admit that scientists are poorly equipped to understand morality and ethics. Then he proceeds to claim that God does not exist because science can explain everything, but we know that it can't explain God. Finally, we come to his Achilles to heel. Do you believe in fairy stories? Well, Goldilocks is his undoing. There are six fundamental constants that are universally acknowledged as critical to life on Earth and even to the existence of the Earth. Amazingly, each of these numbers is acknowledged as to be not too little, not too much, but just right. Hence the Goldilocks tag. Not by chance does the world have these six factors so perfectly balanced but no scientist can explain them. In an unguarded moment, some scientist might reply, well, only God knows, or God only knows. Let's examine some examples of these Goldilocks factors. Consider this, we know that the Earth spins around once every day, hence day and night. If we take a weight on a string and we whirl it around our head, then we let go and it flies off at great speed. David killed Goliath with something similar. Well, the Earth at the equator measures all the way round just over 24,000 miles. It turns all the way round in 24 hours. So a person just sitting still on the equator will unknowingly be travelling at a thousand miles an hour. It's hard to get your head round, isn't it? So why don't we all go just spinning off into space? The answer is because the centrifugal force that would throw us out is perfectly balanced by two other forces. One is gravity. If we take an apple and, as Isaac Newton noted, we let go, it falls to the ground. The other force is pressure, as measured by a barometer. This pressure weighs us down. At the bottom of the sea is too heavy for us and out in space it's too light for us but here on earth it is just right. Take a drop of water. It's formed by two atoms of hydrogen and one of oxygen hence the formula H2O. But what holds them together? The answer is another of God's perfect forces. God created a perfect balance for all these critical factors and everything about us is totally dependent on them. Yet science has no alternative answers as to how these perfectly balances 
are continually achieved. We can all agree that the wonders of God, as witnessed in creation, are beyond human understanding. So God has created this wonderful world and entrusted it to us. How well have we cared for it? Well, for the last 10,000 years, we've mostly done all right. But in the last 100 years, much of which is in the lifetime of some of us, we have done badly. In the last 50 years, our care has been disastrous. But the general public are only just starting to get the message. And reasonably recently, loud voices have yet to understand this rapidly advancing danger for the whole world. We give thanks for David Attenborough and Greta Thunberg with their clarion calls for action now. In the future, COVID will become just an inconvenience and a bad memory. But global warming will be recognised as a catastrophe affecting all people everywhere. It will be so evident in our grandchildren's lifetimes. We have to react now. Electric cars are coming. Solar power will soon be storable. But that's the future. Right now, we still buy fruit that is tainted with air miles. We still clog the oceans with plastic waste. Some still oppose wind farms and solar farms and waste recycling plants. They look, but they do not see. Our climate is changing. Forest fires are more destructive. Floods and droughts are destroying crops. And yet our world population is exploding exponentially. Wars are laying vast areas to waste. The world has never been so rich, nor tension so rife. Social media is invasive and misleading. Peace, security, health, contentment are the values that are sinking in our consumerist society. As custodians of God's creation, those to come will mark our legacy, but they'll sadly note that we've done badly, prioritising the here and now and neglecting our mission to care for God's world. The time for national and international resolve and action is now, but we each can make a difference. But meanwhile, in this most beautiful and peaceful corner of God's creation, we are greatly blessed. When Jan and I walk by the River Avon each day with our dogs, we marvel at the wonders and beauty of all creation all around us and we relish the peace of it. We are awestruck by the merry lady swimmers who pass us each day, including right through the winter. We delight in the mighty willow trees and the little ducklings and cygnets. We're so very blessed to be here and we are grateful. God is awesome. To help celebrate the glory of nature, up at Hyde Church and Churchyard, we're holding an open afternoon this Saturday, the 5th of June. This event is called God's Acre and included is a photo exhibition called God's Creation, Wildlife. You are all freely welcome. Thank you for being with me to share these thoughts. May God be with you. And to finish, I've chosen a John Rutter song of praise for creation. <laughs>